Thank you, Tim. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Rick and I, as Tim said, uh, moderated two panels yesterday, and so our charge here today is to try to do our best job of summarizing those panels. Uh, first, I should say we, we both agreed that there's no possible way that we could substitute for Rick Boucher, so instead we're going to try to do our best imitations of Tony Kornheiser and Michael Wilbon and <laughs> let you decide which is which. Um, I was both a moderator and a panelist on yesterday's session, uh, but I've been asked to appear here as a, in my role as moderator, so I guess the first thing I'm going to do is summarize myself. Uh, so bear with me, but um, I'd like to start out by referring to the EDUCAUS proposal for whom uh, I do quite a bit of consulting work. And just about a year ago, EDUCAUS put out its plan called a Blueprint for Big Broadband. And that was one of the first plans that called for very explicit government funding and um, uh, support to build broadband networks nationwide. The goal of the EDUCAUS proposal is to build 100 megabits uh, capacity to every home and business in America. And according to the EDUCAUS estimates that we came up with, it would cost in total about $100 billion in order to provide that, uh, uh, a total of $100 billion investment would be necessary. And the EDUCAUS proposal is to ask the federal government to pay for one third of that. So $32 billion from the federal government. Now at the time that was seen as ambitious, expensive. Uh, today it's right in the ballpark of the items that are under consideration in the stimulus package uh, according to the, the press accounts and uh, certain conversations that we've had with the Obama transition team. So we do see, think that there's some life behind that proposal, proposal and also because several of the other parties on the panel also put forth, since EDUCAUS proposal, they have put forth their own proposals for broadband stimulus. And I'm going to try to to, to summarize each of these very briefly and turn it over to Rick who will talk about the next panel. Uh, but just in brief, the EDUCAUS plan uh, is focused primarily on grants, although it did say tax incentives are important, uh, allowing municipalities to build broadband is also significant. But the unique feature of the EDUCAUS plan is what it called for the creation of a new universal broadband fund. And this is important to identify that as separate and distinct from the existing Universal Service Fund, which I know a lot of folks have focused their time and energy on saying how we could transition the Universal Service Fund to cover more broadband. And that's perfectly appropriate. That should be done. But there's also a role for a, a separate fund to handle just the construction costs. In other words, the Universal Service Fund is an annual allocation appropriate or, or funding that goes to companies to subsidize their ongoing maintenance costs of operation. The Universal Broadband Fund that EDUCAUS has put forward, however, would be a one-time shot just to deal with the biggest impediment to broadband, which is the, the construction costs, the digging the trenches, uh, 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 laying the wires, building the antennas. Those kinds of expenses need to be dealt with up front. Um, so EDUCAUS focused on grants largely because that seemed to be the best way to produce progress. And that's not to dismiss the virtues of tax incentives and, uh, uh, and loan programs and other measures, uh, but the feeling is that grants can go straight to the market that needs it the most. And through the use of a competitive bid feature in the EDUCAUS proposal, then the, the amount of funding would be targeted and flexible based upon the needs of that market. So for instance, in one local market may only need 5% of the funding to come from the federal government, whereas another local market, 50% of the funding may need to come from the federal government. So there are some virtues there that you know exactly what you're getting. You can measure exactly that this town got a grant and with a commitment by whoever wins that grant has to deploy 100 megabits of broadband to every home and business in that local market and, and I think has some real benefits, at, at least according to Windhausen. Uh, James Assey was next on our panel. He is the Executive Vice President of the National Cable Telecommunications Association, the same organization that Rick represents here. Uh, so if I mischaracterize James, uh, Rick is free to, to correct me. Uh, but James, in his comments, focused a little bit more um, on the uh, unserved markets. Uh, he began by noting that across America today, that 92% of consumers' homes have broadband available to them through cable modem services. So the question that James raised is, do we really need a lot of extra government funding to serve areas where 92% of homes already have broadband available? 
maybe we should be targeted on that 8% of homes that don't have broadband available today. He also noted the need for competitive equity. In other words, if there's a broadband provider in a market or perhaps two broadband providers in a market, how can you ensure that any government assistance going to that market doesn't tilt the playing field in favor of one entity over another entity? And James cautioned about the, uh, against the need for big federal government spending programs that might tilt the playing field in favor of one provider over another. And third, James also noted uh, that there's a demand issue here, that across the country only, uh, that about 20% of consumers' homes don't even have a computer. So he raised the question, which is a legitimate question, um, shouldn't we also be focused on trying to enhance the availability of services, trying to bring down the cost of computers so that consumers would find their broadband services more, uh, 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 more affordable and more usable for them, and maybe that should be the focus of the federal government investments in broadband, at least according to, to James. Uh, James was followed on the panel by Rob Atkinson. Uh, he is the president and founder of, the, of ITIF, the Innovation Technology and, no, Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, a think tank. Uh, Rob is, and his group is one of the most prolific uh, organizations in this town that has spent a lot of time and energy focused on broadband and issued several papers talking about not just broadband deployment but also the, the uses of broadband. Um, Rob, made a couple of, uh, Rob made a couple of very important points. He said, First to the demand question, he agreed with James that yes, that is a big issue. And in fact, part of the ITIF proposal is to uh, suggest that the government should fund the cost of computers, that that should be a part of the Lifeline and Link Up Plan uh, expansion that he is recommending to the next administration so that you encourage consumers to lower the cost of computers so that they can get on the network. Um, when it came time to address the supply side, uh, the differences between tax credits, grants, and loans, um, Rob's plan, ITIF's plan, has a mix of both grants and loans in their, uh, I'm sorry, grants and tax credits, but he tended to uh, uh, favor the implementation of tax credits for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, because he said they can take effect right away. And one of the big priorities of the stimulus plan, of course, is to get this economy moving and to pump the economy with some, some investment incentives right away. And he wondered how quickly a grant program could actually be implemented and speculated that it might be third quarter, third quarter or fourth quarter of this year before a grant program could actually have some impact. Tax credits, on the other hand, he said, could go to the companies and have an impact immediately as they ramp up their plans. And finally, Derek Turner uh, was on the panel. He is the research director from Free Press. Free Press, actually, I, I give uh, Free Press and Derek Turner a lot of credit because they put forth the most comprehensive plan of any of them that are out there uh, involving not just tax credits, grants, and loans, but also some very innovative ideas. And I'll touch on just a couple of them. Uh, Free Press is advocating for a competitive fiber tax credit. In other words, if one company is going to get a tax credit to build fiber uh, to every home and business, perhaps they should be required as a part of the tax incentive to build multiple strands of fiber within that same cable and then sell or allocate that capacity, that excess capacity, to other providers. That's both a way of taking maximum advantage or minimizing the disruption of, build, of digging up the streets, but yet also allowing for a more competitive broadband environment. And Free Press has also suggested the use of something called broadband bonds, which he talked about as uh, a real value for companies that don't pay taxes. In other words, those companies and entities that uh, if they don't pay taxes, they're not necessarily going to benefit from a tax credit. Uh, Derek's thought was that perhaps companies uh, should be able to sell bonds and the government should pay the interest for those bonds. So that then nonprofit entities and companies uh, such as competitive local phone companies or CLECs that don't make profits today, they could take advantage of a broadband, bro broadband bond program in order to enhance their build out. So a lot of very good ideas were raised yesterday. Uh, I think it's our hope that all of these ideas get adopted in one way or another in this broadband stimulus program. And uh, uh, we look forward to your discussion and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Rick? Thanks, John. 
and uh, Tim, appreciate the opportunity to uh, be here now. I know for the audience, you thought you'd get Rick Boucher. Instead, you're getting Rick Zimmerman. So it's a disappointment for you, but my mother will be very pleased. Um, one thing Tim didn't mention is all the previous speakers were from Virginia, but in order to bring some geographic diversity, John and I are both from Maryland. I've lived there for about uh, 17 years, uh, but I'm also a proud member of the Gator Nation and a graduate of the University of Florida. I just got back uh, this week from Miami where we won our second BCS national championship in the last three years. So I just have to say go Gators before we uh, proceed. Um, so let me just dive right in. Uh, we had on John's panel a robust discussion of more and faster broadband, how to get it, its role in stimulus, job creation. We thought that we should follow that up with a panel entitled, If We Build It, Will They Come? Barriers to Broadband Adoption. And the gist of that was, sure, we can discuss how you get more and faster broadband, but what about the broadband that we have today? Residential adoption rates hover at about 57%. Broadband use by commercial and institutional users uh, or entities, particularly with respect to energy efficiency in the environment, uh, telemedicine and healthcare, education, uh, maybe not reaching its fullest potential. That's despite the fact that, as James had alluded to on the first panel, uh, we alone in the cable industry have made an investment over the last 12 years of $145 billion to bring broadband across the country, uh, putting it in front of 92% of homes. Uh, the telcos have made major investments clearly. They serve some areas we don't. Uh, the satellite broadband as well, wireless broadband. So the unserved part of the country, uh, at least with some form of broadband, something less than 8% uh, since at least 92% is served. So we've got this widespread deployment, some unserved areas that clearly uh, need to be addressed on what you do, some underserved areas, maybe uh, speeds aren't what we'd like to do, uh, them to be, but in general doing pretty well. So there's been sort of a virtuous cycle, cable deployed broadband, then DSL came out, we offered higher speeds, AT&T is rolling out Yearverse, Verizon's rolling out Fios with a 50 meg downstream, 20 meg upstream. Comcast and other cable companies rolling out uh, DOCSIS 3.0 technology, which allows a 50 megabit downstream uh, capability. I think they have reached about 25% of their footprint with, uh, with that DOCSIS 3.0 technology. Just in the last couple of days, uh, Broadcom announced the development of a chip that will allow a 300 megabit downstream. Uh, and uh, with eight channel bonding, Cisco is gonna manufacture some modems that, uh, that will do that. Uh, so just an editorial note, I guess, that uh, you know, fiber to the home is not the only way to get uh, tremendous capability with respect to uh, broadband. Uh, hybrid fiber coax network as cable is deploying uh, does the job as well. So uh, uh, that's it for the sales pitch, I guess. But the question is why isn't, several questions. The first question, why isn't residential adoption higher? So our first panelist, John Horrigan, well known to many of you from the Pew Internet Research Center is the leading authority, I think, with the survey research that they have done on why people choose to adopt or not adopt broadband service. Uh, I would commend to you his research, which is available on the web. I think July 2008 is the most recent iteration of that research that's available. But there are any number of reasons that folks don't uh, adopt. There, first of all, are a core set of dial-up users that see no reason to change. Uh, there are some folks that have it at work and see no need to have it at home. Uh, there are digital slash computer literacy uh, issues that you know uh, don't know how to use a computer. Uh, a separate set of issues are those that don't have a computer, whether it's they can't afford or a, any number of various reasons. Um, you have the senior population with, uh, with a separate set of issues also related to sometimes just scared to get online, you know, maybe need someone to assist them, the computer issues, all of those things uh, John talked a little bit about, but a, a diverse set of factors, no one answer as to why uh, folks are choosing not to adopt. And of course, you know, price for some folks is an issue as well. One of the interesting statistics, though, that comes out of looking at uh, John's data is that if you take seniors out of the mix, and clearly I'm not saying that we should do that uh, generally and we need to focus on how to get more seniors online, but if you look at the data without 
seniors, the adoption rates are much, much higher and getting higher because as the young people uh, age, get into school, go through school, et cetera, adoption rates are higher. So, um, so in, in some sense, just you know, the march of time and demography will fix the problem a, a little bit. But we then move from John to Austin Bonner of One Economy. And you heard Blair mention One Economy and some of their great work this morning because that's where Alec Ross came to the transition team from. Uh, One Economy, a public-private partnership, and they've got a number of programs that address some of the specific issues that John Horrigan has identified as uh, leading to, uh, I guess, a lag in broadband adoption, and particularly working with uh, low-income communities and a number of programs. One of them, their Digital Connectors program that deals with uh, technical training. First of all, training uh, young people to help others get online. They've also got their Bring It or Bring IT Home America that deals with um, uh, getting folks online with respect to uh, getting um, uh, broadband built into public housing and also laptops in the hands or computers in the hands of those that don't have. So a number of one economy problems that are specific solu or, uh, 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 solutions that are solutions to specific problems that uh, John Horrigan identified. Uh, we then heard from Jeff Daly of uh, App Rising, uh, apprising.com, one of the best names, I think, of a, uh, of, of a website out there. Um, he made three basic points that we need to work on policymakers that uh, should encourage connected behavior and give people more reasons to go online, and as one specific example of what you might do, uh, perhaps tax credits for businesses that allow their employees to telecommute. I think that's a good solid idea that, uh, you know, that ought, folks ought to think about because telecommuting has so many benefits in terms of just, you know, emissions and, and uh, the environment and, you know, keeping people off the road and more people on broadband and et cetera and, you know, better work-life balance, all, all of those things. Um, he also mentioned that um, uh, what industry can do innovate in interfaces and packages. So one example there was maybe free or discounted a computer or laptop with a two-year subscription. Kind of the same model that has been adopted in the wireless world with respect to cell phones. Uh, I don't know the extent to which, uh, if at all, any broadband providers are doing anything like that, but that was one example. And he also talked about uh, the, uh, the proliferation of digital devices. He talked about the Chumbi in particular. Uh, but those kinds of devices that, you know, maybe without being full-blown laptop computer may encourage folks to get online uh, as well. And then finally talked about basically early adopters and other current broadband users evangelizing and assisting those that aren't online to the extent that, you know, fear of the Internet or, uh, or training uh, or uh, literacy, digital literacy, computer literacy is an issue that, uh, you know, help your grandparents, help your friends, neighbors uh, get online. All of those things that could be done. We then heard from Joanne Hovis, who is the president of Columbia Telecommunications uh, and also a director of NATOA. NATOA is the National Association of Telecommunications Officers and Administrators, basically the municipal and city personnel that run their um, uh, offices of telecommunications, whether it's regulation or cable uh, and those sorts of things. And she talked about the role of municipalities and local government in uh, both evangelizing with respect to broadband, but also in some cases being broadband provider. Mentioned that I believe the number was 15 states with prohibitions on uh, municipal entry into the business and drew some analogies to public power um, over the years that perhaps it's an appropriate role for local government to be in the business uh, in particular. And talked about what she referred to as uh, competitor cities, which are cities uh, outside of the U.S. with whom cities in the U.S. are competing in one manner or another, and in particular in Japan with their 100 megabit uh, broadband moving perhaps to one gigabit, and shouldn't be that be you know what we are what our goal is, uh, and the need for economic development and the desire for additional competition, all leading to uh, more broadband and the important role of cities in that. Finally, we heard a, from Link, uh, hoeing of Verizon, and maybe the 
biggest surprise of the day for those that you uh, that uh, for those of you that know Link is that uh, he did not use PowerPoint slides. So um, so it was a good day for all of us. Uh, but um, but his uh, um, yeah, actually you know what I thought was the not the biggest surprise, maybe the most important point of the day, and so I don't want to mischaracterize or, or not paraphrase if John, uh, the, not paraphrase correctly. John, check me if I'm wrong on this, but it's similar to the point Blair made with the, the, the circles here, the radiation symbol or whatever that turned out to be, which was uh, when Derek Turner of Free Press uh, indicated that, you know, there are a lot of policy goals in which free press believes and uh, feels are important, believes are important, but that stimulus, uh, economic stimulus with respect to broadband is sort of a separate issue and that you shouldn't necessarily mix the two. So that in other words, uh, you know, many of the policy goals that, that folks might want to achieve with respect to broadband policy, and so this is where Blair had the larger circle that said, hey, there's a lot we want to do with national broadband, Stimulus is just one piece of that, and you can't cram everything into it. So I thought that was an important point worth highlighting. But back to Link, his overall theme was, hey, it's not all doom and gloom out there. There's a lot of cause for optimism. He referenced the virtuous circle or cycle uh, that there's been about $60 billion of investment. I wasn't sure over the time period. That might have just been in the last year. Investment total by phone companies, cable, Verizon obviously investing a lot in Fios and others. And frankly, that the communications industry is one of the few industries that's making such large capital uh, investments. And, you know, another editorial note from me, unlike our friends in the financial industry, you know, if in fact they're still our friends, uh, these are real investments in real physical assets. That's what the communications industry has been uh, doing over the last few years to bring broadband and other new services out there. Uh, Link also made the point, don't forget about wireless broadband. He talked about EVDO, 4G, and you know, all the other wireless acronyms with which I'm not familiar, but that when you look at broadband usage and adoption, and this even maybe goes a little bit to John Horrigan's sort of uh, wired broadband statistics, that some folks may choose not to be wired broadband-wise because they are wirelessly broadband uh, connected. And then Link talked a little bit about uh, Connected Nation, which uh, is, is doing something that Secretary Chopra referred to indirectly. He didn't mention Connected Nation, but he talked about Franklin County and getting everyone together in the county and the state agencies that are using and the educational institutions and the, the community needs and all of those things. And that's something that Connected Nation, through what they call e-community teams, has done in some various states to bring everyone together to drive broadband demand and therefore, in some cases, uh, uh, bring broadband deployment to areas where it doesn't uh, exist. So that was the general gist of the barriers to adoption panel. The bottom line was that there's really no one size fits all to uh, encouraging adoption. There's a lot of reasons why uh, people don't subscribe, uh, it, but in particular, when kids go to school, people tend to get more online. There are still clearly income disparities and issues to, um, that, that need to be dealt with. One of the uh, statistics that I think I mentioned this, I don't know if anyone else did, but uh, when last look, I guess this is in, in, in John's data, that families over $100,000 household income with, uh, with kids under 18, I believe the figure was upwards of 80% are uh, connected online, but households with under $35,000 of income, even with kids under 18, only about 29% are connected, and that's something that we need to do with, uh, do something about. And so one of the um, demand side solutions that was uh, mentioned, well, it's, I know it's part of uh, Free Press's proposal, it's part of NCTA's proposal, all in different ways, but some kind of broadband lifeline link up, that's the universal service program that helps get people online for phones, our own proposal would say uh, fund it through the federal government and not through assessment on telecommunications carriers the way universal service is funded today. And of course, any broadband provider ought to be eligible. You shouldn't have to be otherwise eligible for the universal service fund. But having said that, some specific targeted programs are trying to get low-income folks online by reducing the, the price. So, um, so even as we look at uh, how to get broadband to where it isn't and how to get higher speeds, uh, where it is, uh, even as we do all that, 
we have to look at the question of essentially, you know, broadband, what is it good for? Uh, that's still a relevant question as we move forward. So Tim is over here, and uh, I guess Tim will turn it back to you and see if we have time for questions. Questions before we uh, go into breakouts? Any? Thank you, John and, and Rick. That was an astounding summary of yesterday's events. Uh, in the back. Hi, Larry Magid with CBS News, CNET, and Connect Safely. You used the term bailout, I believe, or maybe you didn't use the term bailout, but the term bailout has, has been bantied about a lot. And I'm wondering, when we think about whatever the broadband programs are and the investment we're going to make in cable and telecom, how do we make sure it isn't a replication of what we've seen so far in terms of money going to large institutions and questionably whether it's actually filtering down to the individuals and the families and the people who need it? If I could take a first stab at that, and that's a reminder that our panel was actually entitled build out, not bailout, uh, because this is not intended to be a bailout mechanism. The, the, the telecom and broadband is, industry is not in financial distress. Um, but the point is that if we just continue on the current path, that we're not going to get broadband built out to where it needs to be. At least that's the EDUCAUSE point of view. Um, and actually, free press started out, uh, Derek Turner started out with his comments saying, look, he's with a consumer organization that is not usually in the position of advocating for more money to go to incumbent carriers, um, given their track record, and, and he would say a poor track record. Um, but in this particular circumstance, where broadband has taken on, um, well, but broadband is the next key infrastructure um, and having an available broadband, uh, uh, having broadband available to you is more than just a luxury, right? It's now become uh, an essential uh, necessity requiring government involvement because as Rob Atkinson has said, getting broadband to everybody is more than just uh, the profit and loss statements of the individual companies. Uh, they may look at their financial sheets and say, make a decisions about where they can earn a profit and where they can't earn a profit. But as Rob Atkinson has said, there are many societal benefits like health care, like distance learning, uh, um, uh, like uh, uh, public safety and homeland security that benefit from having an advanced broadband network. Those benefits don't show up on the profit and loss statements of these companies. So back to the EDUCAUSE plan, that's one of the reasons why we think a grant program probably makes the most sense because it is very definable, it's measurable. In other words, you give a grant to a particular location and then you can determine uh, that it has to be built out to those schools and homes uh, uh, and, uh, and businesses in that market. So it's very measurable. There's much more accountability over a grant program like that. And frankly, that's something that the Universal Service Fund doesn't do all that well. Accountability is not a strong point of the high cost fund. Basically, it's money given to incumbent phone companies, and there's no reporting requirements. You don't know whether they actually use that for the purposes for which it's intended. So a grant program that's designed well with specific accountability objectives is, is what EDUCAUSE is looking for. And so from our perspective, uh, you know, certainly I didn't use the term uh, bailout. Uh, Rob Atkinson talked about a combination of tax credits, grants, other things. I think uh, you know, Free Press has done the same. Uh, our proposal really focuses more on uh, tax credits than outright grants. Um, I think many of you know some of the concerns that we've had in the past with uh, the way some grant programs have been uh, used to essentially uh, fund additional uh, competitors and providers where, uh, where uh, we've already invested, not just us, the phone companies have invested private capital and not sure the accountability measures have been in place and certainly agree with respect to universal service, but other than the broadband lifeline link-up portion of our recommendation, which would be uh, sort of an outright uh, grant, if you will, uh, we're looking more at tax credits for additional investment. And let me be clear also when I say tax credits, I mean that broadly I am not a finance guy. That includes such things as bonus depreciation, maybe net loss carryovers for companies that are uh, investing so heavily that they're not actually showing uh, a profit. But as opposed to outright uh, grants, we think that, uh, that a, a tax credit mechanism 
uh, would do a better job of ensuring the kind of accountability that we're talking about. I'm, I'm sorry we only have time for one question. Um, I want to thank Rick and John for